Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Clara Chiwei Pei. Um, I'm an independent curator and arts writer based in Singapore. Um, and I was also the curator for Art Dubai Digital last year. Um, I'm also currently Asia Collection Fellow at CADIS. So feel free to chat with me about any of these things after if you would like. Um, but today, I'm glad to be here with Chris. Aileen, Ila, in Ouch Studio uh, to talk about the impact of technological transformation on uh, contemporary art. Given the really broad scope of technological transformation, what that entails, also like contemporary art, um, I've just like to narrow down the scope of this discussion a little um, to really focus in on uh, more emerging technologies, namely here maybe blockchain and artificial intelligence. Um, I've also like to foreground that when we speak about these transformations, um, we can consider maybe two ends of this conversation. Uh, the first being a little bit on the production, the creative process side of uh, things, and then the other maybe a little more focused on the distribution and consumption end. Um, so on the panel here, we have with us predominantly you know, artists, um, curators, cultural workers. So we're going to focus more on the creation, production side of the conversation. Um, and think about what it means, uh, you know, from the artist's perspective. But if you're interested in the conversations around how this um, interacts with distribution, with sales, with modes of presentations, I think the digital section's um, a great place to start and to have that conversation. So I invite you to uh, take a look if you haven't had a chance. Um, but first, just to start, I'd really like to invite each of our speakers here to give us a short introduction into your work and what you do. Aileen, if you would like to start. Sure. Thank you, Clara, for introducing this panel, and thank you to Art Dubai for having me for the first inaugural digital summit. Um, my name is Aileen Isagon Skyers. I was born in Manila and raised in Tampa, Florida, um, and I'm now based in New York City, uh, and I'm a writer, curator, and artist predominantly there. I've worked with a number of different museums and organizations, as well as a host of uh, Web3 platforms in more recent years, um, among them David Zwerner, Rhizome, the Whitney Museum, Foundation, and then most recently Fingerprints DAO. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's about it. <laughs> uh, my name is Krista Kim. Um, uh, I basically want to create digital Zen experiences. Um, I've been creating these, uh, I would just say, like immersive Zen experiences using the, using the digital medium. Um, I'm very interested in uh, metaverse and uh, yeah, I, I want to create a sublime experience using the digital because I believe that digital is very bad for our mental health. And it's uh, simply a, <clears throat> a medium that is not designed for our well-being, nor is it designed for our natural uh, you know, brain functioning. In fact, it's quite damaging, right? And we all know this. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make an intervention in using the screen as a mechanism for wellness and healing. I'm a meditator. And um, now I have a, an installation that was commissioned by Julius Baer. It's, uh, it's an, immerse, an immersive experience that is a biometric AI generative co-creative artwork taking your ECG data and uh, extracting an algorithm uh, using AI to then uh, set parameters of color, waveforms, and movement, uh, where therefore on the screen you have the interaction and the beautiful harmonization of heartbeat algorithms, and the heartbeat is uh, a universal language. It's very poetic. And uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's what I'm doing. Please come and check it out at the Julius Bear Lounge. Uh, thank you. By the way, if you can play the number one video during the talk without the sound, I really appreciate that. Um, I am Ferdi. 
uh, director of the Out Studio. Uh, we have been working in this field approximately last 14 years around. It was so long journey. Approximately 30 percentage of our life maybe. Um, we expertise in AI data uh, and public spaces. We're trying to create poetic immersive experiences around the world. And the team consists of very talent from AI artists, engineers, academicians, coders, data scientists, designers, new media artists, and all that people sing one vision, making hybrid public arts. But the thing is, I think uh, the main thing is we're trying to integrate art, science, and technology inside of the public spaces. So it means this is not just cool, abstract animation. It's more than this. There's a scientific background. For example, the, we made the collaboration before CERN, NASA, SAT, Montreal, Singapore Art Science Museum, Mori Museum, Tokyo. And, and we really love to put the a kind of the story behind the installation. So it means there is a journey, there is a very academic statement behind the creation process, and it's so complex. According to the, our know-how, we already use the, every type of the audiovisual technology in the world, like AR, VR, XR, LED projectors, custom uh, architectural the, the screens or holograms. Yes, we are high level, high level, using the high level technology and algorithm, but we are not technology based actually, we are idea based. So it means idea always comes first. Then after that we try making happen that idea with the exist technology. But sometimes we had to hack the technology for making, make happen to that idea. And uh, I am so excited to be here actually after the long journey because we were in Orlando last week and we sent our art piece to the space, literally. Right now, uh, Surface on the Moon, the one of the AI art piece, you can exhibit if you can go. <laughs> but if you want to see the ouch, just look at the moon at the nights. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ila Colombo. I'm a creative director, design strategist, and prompt engineer. Uh, slightly different background. Um, we also work with art, but predominantly within architecture and design uh, spectrum. So uh, my work involves a creative direction that informs anything from product design, industrial design, architectural installations, and conceptual work. We work with uh, museum and art installations as well, and uh, private commissions or commercial commissions. At the moment, we're also working on quite a large-scale um, art collective project with the space and uh, the Polaris program, who's, um, it's a comprehensive uh, space program integrating science, medicine, and commercial operations. In fact, it's going to um, be setting the first uh, commercial private spacewalk and some uh, medical scientific uh, tech tests and examinations done at zero gravity in space in uh, collaboration with the St. Jude's Hospital from US, whose uh, main mission is to cure um, a lot of uh, children diseases and cancers and bring this uh, knowledge-based transfer within the art and philanthropic uh, spectrum to inform the public around these uh, missions. So you have medicine, space, and art in combination. Uh, from a purely professional background, uh, since their public release in uh, summer of 2022, I've been closely working with AI and see how generative AI can inform uh, knowledge transfer and use uh, our um, professional data set to create new products and new projects that are more uh, optimized, not just in understanding speciality in the three-dimensional sense, but also how we can uh, connect data and the public in a more uh, intuitive and transformative uh, manner. Uh, so the Polaris program is one, but we're also training our own models uh, using um, retrieval augmented generation and using our own data sets to create, uh, again, optimized um, architectural spaces. 
Thank you so much. Um, I love how interdisciplinary the panel is, and it's really interesting to hear, you know, in your work, sort of the different ways in which you each are working um, with technology or looking at technologies. Um, I know initially, you know, one of the questions I had prepared was to really think about examples in which technology and technological transformation has maybe impacted your work. I think since we've had an opportunity to hear about some examples of what you do, um, I'm wondering if we could maybe pick up where we left off and dive a little further into, for example, you know, the projects you spoke about um, to then uh, tell us a little bit more about, from your perspective, how technology feeds into your work. Um, and I'm wondering if we can start again with Aileen, coming from a curator's perspective, um, how does this factor into your work and how do you work with artists um, who work around technologies? This is a really poignant question, I think, because I have been working with and curating digital media works for so long. Um, I've definitely seen a lot of rapid transformation in the last few years in terms of the ways in which artists are approaching digital media and um, software, and also obviously like integrating um, blockchain into their practices. Um, this is all still very nascent, and I think a lot about um, the challenge that poses to media curators and conservationists um, in many ways because I don't regard the blockchain as like this immutable record of um, art history in the present moment. Um, and I think a lot about archives in that sense of like whose histories are being recorded on chain and whose are being left out. So it's definitely affected my mental framework as a curator in that sense. Um, as a digital artist, um, uh, you know, I'm, I've been creating work since 2012. And I would always get anxiety every time I would send a WeTransfer file before blockchain, all right? Because like, who's gonna have access to the file? Who's gonna copy it? And I'm just gonna lose, it's gonna be everywhere. I don't know, it's gonna, it's like a baby. And um, once I discovered blockchain, um, December of 2020, 2020 uh, we're still under COVID lockdowns, right? And um, I was like so curious about uh, Bitcoin at the time and did some research and then I was like, oh, blockchain, interesting, blockchain. Oh, blockchain for art, Googled that, NFTs came up and I was like, oh my God. And then I went deep into the rabbit hole of NFTs. I was so delighted that there were platforms already uh, engaged in the trade of uh, NFTs, super rare. And so I signed up and I was one of the first, you know, artists that were in, taken in um, at that time. They were taking in new artists and I was whitelisted for February of 2021. And um, I literally was like so elated. It was almost like a religious experience when I minted my first artwork, my Genesis piece. And it was like this moment where I was like, oh my God my art is going to be immutable and exist forever in the blockchain. And I found it, you know, existential and I pressed the, I was shaking, I pressed the, you know, enter and it minted. I'm like, oh my God, it was such a, you know, the uh, minting, I was the NFT virgin. <laughs> and then um, upon uh, analyzing the marketplace, and the actual, uh, you know, where it was in the stage of technology and development, I, of course, we all know that NFTs are going to be, uh, you know, powered by AI and 3D assets eventually with AR, et cetera. You know, you know spatial computing, augmented reality, we're all gonna be wearing glasses uh, that will allow us to see digital assets at all times and have digital experiences at all times, and therefore we're going to be uh, trading and you know, buying and selling and, and you know, uh, trading digital assets uh, on a regular basis that are tied to physical, that's also powered by AI. And so <clears throat> when um, you know, I had a house called the Mars House that I created during the COVID crisis about, uh, it was like March of 2020, and I had it ready 
and it you know, had the 3D files, Unreal Engine. The whole intention of the project was to visit the house in VR and create it in Unreal Engine, but I didn't know what blockchain was. I had no idea of NFTs. But then once I knew about this technology, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if the world is ready for like actual digital assets and the concept, the conceptualization of owning digital physical assets, including real estate and you know, high-priced items, investments. And eventually that's where it's all going to go, of course. All transactions are going to be on the blockchain. And so um, I minted the Mars house as an NFT, the first metaverse house that was sold as an NFT in March 2021. And that experiment became successful. And uh, I sold it. And uh, it, it caused a bit of controversy in the architectural world because they're like, these are... 3D renderings that we make every day and this person just sold it? Like, what happened here? Because this is pre-metaverse, pre-meta becoming, uh, Facebook becoming meta. So now we're fast forwarding into the era of AI because AI, of course, is a new thing. I think that my practice is always engaged at the leading edge of technology because that's simply what I'm interested in. And I'm always trying to engage at the leading edge how can I push this further? And of course, how can this serve humanity? So Heart Space Now is a conversation where I'm trying to reframe the paradigm of fear of AI generative technology, where in fact, you can look at it as a medium that will allow us to communicate using biometrics, you name it, communication between human beings and eliminating the language barriers or com communicating simply with your biometric heartbeats, co-creation, scalability. I mean, the possibilities are incredible for transcending, uh, you know, all kinds of barriers and creating art on a whole new level. It's just the beginning. So I'm very excited by that. Well, I think, you know, what's really great about what Elena and Krista talked about is you um, ex you shared a little bit from the perspective, Elaine, from looking at, you know, the art historical side of the conversation. Um, you asked, you know, whose art histories will be able to be recorded and remembered and be in that narrative. Um, and Krista, you talked a bit about how, you know, for example, Mars House was something that you had created sort of pre-blockchain, um, but it was really the the mode of being able to, you know, mint this, to be able to share this and sell this as a work, that that sort of was the spark, that was the sort of transformation for you. Um, so coming to Ila and uh, to talk about Ouch Studio, you know, I wonder if we could maybe talk about this in relation to your project from the creation process side of the conversation. Both of you work with AI and both of you, interestingly enough, have, you know, work um, related to space or space exploration in this moment. Um, so I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more from this perspective of, you know, was there a moment for you where you started using maybe a new technology or a new digital tool um, that really unlocked new possibilities for you? Uh, uh, can we play video too without the sound? <laughs> <laughs> I am always the usual guy. It's got all uh, the tactics. So, uh, not this one, the other one. So, uh, the tools always the purpose what you want uh, actually for us. But uh, the, for the AI, I am not looking to the AI as a tool, uh, as a collaborator. So. I would like to explain, for example, one of the, this project was the process. So according to the, our idea, uh, before the, that opportunity, we have been collaboration with the CERN last five years. This is a long-term relationship with them. And that community, scientific community is amazing. You know, the, the, the world best scientists right there from MIT, Harvard, NYU. So we had a chance, access to world best machine learning professors. Um, and the last project about the human cell atlas. By the way, can you play it as a loop? Uh, that, uh, according to the, that uh, human cell atlas project, uh, more than 1,000 institutes became together. Their aim is 
the preparing to the, the one of the biggest data archived about the human body. So we are talking about more than 32 trillion cells. It's huge. And uh, this is open source, by the way. You can access it. Because they share to the entire that data with the scientific community. And you can make the, your research uh, around the world. I mean, the, too many people can access, too many scientists can access to the, that valuable data for making their research. But we use the, that data for the art purpose. So the, that, uh, that numeric data, we can say CSV files. And then also uh, that files about the RNN and then the, the cells data. You can see the left side actually, this is our source codes and the, the source data. Um, this, uh, this is the first part of the creation process. First of all, we try to understand to the, the data with the different type of the AI classifications codes because that data represents too many different topics. So we, we would like to get understand the different type of the classifications according to the AI. So we could create 100 dimensional data from the three dimensional data. So the, the, the AI uh, can represent the secret relationships between the, that data and giving to the latent space. So when we get the latent space, this is a very nice opportunity. We can make the, our experiential visualization process with the, that. So it looks like a ping pong process actually. The, when after they get to the the AI outputs with the different type of outputs, we're starting to making the our creative process. But it's not enough. When we create something, we are feeding AI again with the R creation. And we are getting to another visual outputs. So the this is endlessly experiential process until the, we decide which one is the best, uh, the final output. And also, the, of course, the, 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 the visual part, when we decide the entire things, also there's a, another AI collaboration about the statement, name of the artwork, sound of the artwork. So you can see that this is amazing friend during the art process for each medium, even for the name of the artwork. And uh, when we created that art piece, we, we, we received the invitation from the Arch Mission. This is the first space project uh, generated by the commercial private company for the moon. So it was one and a half years around um, the process because the approximately 11 times that rocket postponed. When you make the collaboration with the, that space guys, you have to be ready about that because every time you know the, this is heartbeat moment you are waiting yeah the, the two weeks later we can announce of oh, again possible even the last time when we were there it was the amazing red carpet gala everyone celebration you're making the celebration hey we will go to the moon and, and then the one last one hour again postponed in 24 hours but after the launching this is the, the my best moment in my life. I don't know, have you experienced uh, any rocket launch? It looks like a slow motion something and all your, you know, hands and it, it was crazy. Almost we cried. <laughs> um, right now, the, after, the, uh, the, after the entire creation process, uh, we sent to the, our art piece to the New York. There is a very special lab. They uh, write the entire art piece and transform the art piece on the one special disc with the nanotechnology. So it looks like uh, right now everyone can experience like a t it's not disappear even 3,000 years around. So this is a very nice the parallel universe for us. For example, when we put the, the surface on the moon, maybe some spaces can find and maybe they can see, they can understand, they can realize. This is amazing, the, another cinematic story for us during to do that creative process. So I would like to tell you the AI is the not tool for us. Definitely AI is the perfect collaborator. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by the way, amazing works and uh can't wait to explore more about that and um, see the moon, in fact. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, I totally sympathize with what Krista, Eileen, and uh, Ferdi has just explained. We also don't see AI as a tool. Um, in fact, the way our um, the way our brain works is very much a gen generative. So we um, subconsciously and unconsciously uh, work the same way uh, with uh, something called PP, which is prediction processing, which is how generative AI is also based. Um, our difference is that we also have the sensorial factual reality that informs our understanding of the world. Uh, and that's also a different story um, now coming to AI as well. Um, but yeah, within our practice, we work with something called DNA, as in design, nature, art. Um, so the way we're using AI at the moment is in understanding the nat natural part. So um, our studio has been pioneering uh, parametricism and biomimicry for a long time. Uh, and we just created a new platform called Beyond, de Design Beyond Nature and Beyond Imagination out of here in Dubai as well. And so we use technology and now generative AI in understanding and um, helping us processing better the understanding of how nature works. Um, so that's anything from a fractal system, uh, demetrialization, natification, um, cell division and so on in understanding how we can interpret this and simulate the same pattern in the creation of art pieces or architecture, uh, spatial designs and so on, and physical products. Um, so since, uh, again, summer of 2022, uh, generative AI had had um, a huge impact on design and architecture, um, particularly architectural field. Um, and what it's uh, mainly doing from a creation point of view is um, having access and opening up access to virtually anybody to create uh, stunning pieces of uh, architecture from an aesthetical point of view. Now, what we're interested on uh, internally is to um, reinforce our own aesthetics and understanding better our own principles of designing something or creating something, and therefore we work with diffusion models um, and uh, adversarial networks to constantly reinforce our own um, understanding of design. Um, but yeah, it's equally posing a lot of questions on the pure nature of creativity, right? Because if machine is like human and human is like machine, where, there, where is the line and who's the creative, right? We, um, I'm, I'm growing more and more of the idea that the machine is also creative. Uh, and therefore is not something uh, unique to us. What does that mean collectively, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it's a co-creative uh, dynamic. Uh, anything from large language models that can retrieve data, reinterpret data, hallucinate or predict, right? And it's very much something that we constantly do on our daily lives. So it's a very ex uh, nice experience to now be able to augment that interaction and have a back and forth dynamic. Yeah, I think what we're hearing is, um, you know, this sort of close knit, almost like a back and forth conversation, right? Especially from what you've both described, um, that it's iterative, you know, it's generative, and you the work uh, grows alongside how perhaps you know AI grows and so on and so forth. It's this back and forth. Um, so I guess then also then drawing a connection back to something you know, Aileen talked about, um, what gets to be remembered. How do you look at the kind of preservation and conservation of your work, you know, especially in a time when technology is moving so fast, the age at which technology becomes obsolete or a certain file type becomes obsolete is so quick. So how do we think about, or how do you think about in your own practice, um, this relationship with your work, you know, into uh, a kind of longer timeline and time scale. Whoever would like to start first. You mean the relation of technological advancement in the time scale of my, my, my practice? It's wide open. <clears throat> I think that with the age of acceleration, we have to be flexible. We have to be open to change and adapt. I mean, that's a choice. There are no rules, of course, with art. Um, but for me, I find that being open, and of course, collaboration, because um, you know, you, there's no possible way that you're going to be an expert in every innovative development. So 
what really excites me and what really inspires me is dialogue. Reaching out, the intersectionality between art, between science, between technology, I find that going forward, you know, our human civilization and the next sort of upgrade or the next evolution of our civilization is the integration um, of all of these uh, different fields. And that's where you find, you know, you connect dots and that's where true innovation comes. Um, Heart Space was created out of a um, a friendship that, um, that I developed with Atalas Kratuni, who's the CEO of Tenbeo. The, the heart rate technology is her, uh, is her intellectual property. Her company is, has developed the ability to extract um, a heart signature, which is unique to every human being, because you can identify the uniqueness of a human being through the thumbprint, retina, heartbeat. Fascinating, isn't it? But the most poetic aspect of the heartbeat is that it is unhackable by AI. So for me, it's not only just the technology, but I think about AI and AGI, what are the threats and what are the solutions to the threats? We need digital identity and data privacy as foundational mechanisms or security measures against the threat of being overtaken by AGI, which is automatic general intelligence, which means that you will have an alien intelligence that's artificial intelligence that acts upon its own agency and creates on its own. So the threat there is the proliferation of deep fakes, misinformation, disinformation, created by an alien intelligence that no one controls. I mean, that is absolute chaotic dystopia. But how can we prevent and protect the future of our humanity, the humanity behind creation against that threat? We must have biomarkers using biometrics. Atalas' technology is proven, is an incredible technology that is an enterprise solution for banks, for any industry, and everybody needs it. Everybody just needs this protective measure against the threat of AI. And what I find fascinating, what really inspires me, is that you can also apply it for art. And in fact, the future is that all of this becomes integrated, not separated, not siloed. We have to use the technology between the arts, between whatever application. But I think that applying it as an art form creates a human connection. And that's why I created HeartSpace to introduce the concept of biometric uh, human connection to AI and humanize the technology. And we have to start doing that. Because if we don't do that, then we are going to enter a world where we are overtaken by the corporate agenda. And that is not a good place to be. Well, Krista, I think you, you know, really wonderfully um, introduced to us and brought us forward into um, a mindset or a very agile and adaptive way, but also um, a very active way of thinking about how to grow alongside technology as we move forward. Um, but I guess coming back to speak about, you know, our, maybe your individual relationships with um, individual artworks in your practice and this conversation of, um, uh, sort of conservation and preservation of individual works. Um, maybe, Aileen, I wonder if you would like to start from a curatorial, from an art historical point of view, you know, how do you look at these relationships and these tensions? It's a really interesting point you bring up because I do work with and speak with a number of artists whose ways of working with AI, say, have already been outmoded um, there can be, you know, months of practice that go into a specific learning language model that then gets replaced or, you know, outdated by um, a new software update. And obviously, oftentimes artists and engineers aren't necessarily in conversation with one another to understand that, like, those tensions are at play. Um, I think to what Krista was saying a little bit earlier, um, we are already in this weird mode or space currently 
where there are algorithms sort of determining and deciding things for us in terms of like what we wear and what we buy. Um, and I think that um, as we become sort of more and more over inundated with images that are generated by AI, it sort of becomes more important to, um, to curate essentially, to be able to critically evaluate these images. I think the artist Claire Silver has this really fun tagline that's like, taste is the new skill because we are seeing so much more media, um, it becomes more important to be able to select and to curate. Um, if I can just go quickly on that, um, I totally sympathize with what uh, both of them um, have described. And um, I mean, if, if you analyze digitalness, if there is such a thing, uh, I think it's impermanent by nature. So conservation is a little bit in contradiction with its own nature. I'm Italian-Brazilian, raised by a Japanese stepfather. In the Japanese culture, there is something like wabi-zabi. Everything is impermanent. And I think digital and digitalness represents that much, uh, very much so. Um, yesterday is not today, today is not tomorrow, and tomorrow is not today. And so it's, it's all blurring, right? And because of um, everything being potentially not limited by preconceptions anymore. I think we are also entering uh, an age where collectiveness is blurred. Like what's relevant to you might not be relevant to me. What is factual to you it might not be factual for me. And therefore that works retrospectively potentially as well. Um, an example in the recent days is Google Gemini, for example, and their generative AI tool uh, within the image generation that has been stopped because they programmed, finally, a generative AI that was unbiased of skin color and racism. But that works also retrospective in terms of what is human history. So they started to have problems with female popes, black Vikings, and so on and so forth. And now Google is uh, confronting a huge scandal, which I don't think it should be, because that's the nature of generative AI, right? The moment you have unbiased, no con preconcepted future or potential to generate, why not? You know, everything is about to be rewritten, rescripted, redesigned, repurposed, recreated. So I think um, as humans, we need to start asking our questions towards what's relevant. Is conservation of what's is been happening today relevant for the future? If the future and the technology are growing so fast, is it really meaningful for me to preserve what I'm doing for my daughter 10 years from now? Probably not. Um, so it's just a different way of looking at um, art, I guess, and embracing that uh, momentarily, uh, moment, momentarious kind of existence, right? It's very relevant to the present moment, and maybe we should just embrace this new dynamic in a way. Um, obviously, there is still... Um, historical relevance, if you want, um, with very important retrospective art. We all know what a Banksy is, we, know, we all know what a Basquiat is, but what does that mean for the future? I think, personally, that there's going to be ever more a separation between craft, analog made, and digital made. And I'm not so sure if they're going to be comparable, which a lot of people still want to make this comparison in terms of value perception and how much one is worth compared to the other. I think cash monetization and value should be rewritten. If you look at architecture and product design, copyright now is a big issue. You have Central Europe wanting to retain the copyright as a concept at an age of AI and new generative uh, creations, I see a huge struggle with that and trying to uh, hold on to that. Um, but again, because that's a very capitalistic kind of mentality. You have created copyright in order to monetize from a given creation. But now publicly and virtually anybody can create something that is an imitation, a simulation, or a replication of that given asset. So again, it's a lot of questions, and we don't know who's the author anymore or what's original anymore, and should we even, even consider that or just embrace this opportunity to virtually be all co-creative, all artists, 
and all participating. May I, may I actually um, just comment that I think it's, um, yes. Uh, so basically, if we are not able to attribute the ownership uh, behind human creation or human, identify what is made by humans versus the machine, then uh, we will have a complete distortion of reality. And that's a dangerous place to be. I believe it's a dangerous place to be. Because you have uh, the media, for example. Uh, we need to know what we are consuming as information that's from generative AI or from a human being who's an actual journalist. And that is why biometric technology of the heartbeat, you create a signature, whatever you create, you sign with your biometric heart, your heart signature that is unhackable by AI, which attributes the human being to the work. Whether it's um, you are depicted on a YouTube channel because you did a podcast, that could be a deep fake. I mean, you could be a politician giving a speech declaring war in another country. But if you are, if you, you know, that could be completely distorting reality and causing wars. Um, you know, the risk is very high if we don't have a sense of reality and truth. We need 100%. a sense of reality and truth. And I and totally humanity. love what Krista is saying. And I actually, it's the first time that I hear such a thing. I met recently someone that was dealing with identity theft in US and they were trying to use AI on solve this issue because now virtually anybody can walk up at your bank or have virtual conversation with your bank and steal your own uh, assets if you want, because that's the power of AI. So this is a great solution, and I think it's up to us human, draw the line of what we want to retain as human and what we want, we want to have as technologically optimized or technologically created, and so on and so forth. Well, I think on that note, I'm just gonna cut in here um, and you know maybe Bring us back and uh, think about some of the things that have been talked about. But also, I'd really love to hear from you, you know, about your perspective on um, these different threats we've explored here. But, you know, what I think what I've been hearing is really these different visions, actually, for um, the future and our different relationships that, you know, we may form with uh, technologies as they evolve. But I think also we've been speaking about how to adapt and also respond to technology that is going to be applied onto us. But as artists, as curators, as creatives, you know, I think we also play an imperative role in these technologies as they are being built and developed. And it's really a conversation between artists, technologies, and you know, people of different fields coming together to decide in terms of what kinds of futures we want to build. Um, and I know we're also running a little short in time, but maybe just to end us off, um, may I leave you, you know, with this big task of articulating what are some sort of visions or what are some of the things that you would like to see in, you know, future and evolving, unfolding conversations between artists and technologists building out this vision of the future? Oh, thank you. It's, it's so deep question. <laughs> um, so the, the beginning of our studio, we always thinking about how we can increase the, our creative process with the experiential techniques. And then uh, the, we try to investigate what is that meaning to be an artist in 21st century using the technology. So that's why last 14 years we have the same motto we are using to data as a paint algorithm, as a brush. Um, and it means that we have a same mindset like a 500 years ago painters like a Van Gogh, Leonardo. Of course, we cannot compare between us and them. They, they are genius. But uh, the thing is, the right now, technology allows us making much more experiential the art, uh, the outputs, which is amazing. It's not the just uh, equipment side or physical side, also algorithm side and content side. So two-sided. Uh, it's always increasing time after the time. Some of them, it's much more fast. For example, according to the, my metaverse um, thinking, it's not, uh, the idea is amazing. Everything is amazing. But the, uh, the CPU and GPU power is not enough for create a very good, valuable experience with that purpose. So it means the CPU and GPU behind the, that creation process right now. But the other side, the algorithm side, AI, is really fast right now. I mean, the, the two months later, I don't have any idea what will be happen. And AGI, it's, 
I think already on the, uh, it's already on the table. We don't know yet. And the interesting thing, actually, the, the, according to our latest conversation in internal our studio, in the history for artistic side and the humanity side, there is a couple of people could make decision about the future of the humanity. And that people, the let's say politicians, the, let's say the less education people, but right now, the engineers and coders making decision about the humanity. You know, the just five people. For example, Mark, the boat, 25% of the entire NVIDIA AI chips for next year. So it means the computer power uh, and the language model is everything if you want to make the decision for the humanity. And also the, the same part is so there are too many mediums and that there are too many, the process increasing to the their knowledge. Some of them behind the process, some of them the front of the process. But definitely I can't wait to see that, that uh, the optimistic future, may, maybe apo apocalyptic future, but it's gonna be awesome, I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> well, to um, comprehensively articulate, I think these deeply interlinked relationships between technological transformation and with contemporary art within the span of 45 minutes is an impossible task. Um, but you know, I hope what we've done here is to open up or to activate different threads for you to think about, to further explore um, and contemplate in your own time. Um, but I think you know, some of the things that um, I really want to sort of emphasize towards the end of this conversation is also to really think about the agency that each of us play in shaping these relationships. A lot of these relationships, you know, I think this is something Aileen brought up as well, are so new. And we have that opportunity to determine what they can look like. Um, so uh, with that in mind, um, I'd also just like to thank Layla, Chris, as well as the whole team that's put this uh, panel together. Thank you so much um, for bringing us here. And thank you to my wonderful speakers for sharing this time and space with me. Um, and thank you everyone for coming out here today. I hope uh, you enjoyed the session and have a good evening. Thank you, Clara. Thank you.